Would you support private and religious schools as an alternative to the public school system, which is failing miserably? Yeah. It is faring miserably. The answer to that question is a, is a firm yes. You have my commitment on that. And in fact, the way we're going to do it is we're going to shut down the U.S. Department of Education. Okay? By the way, we're not just stopping there. When there are these toxic three-letter agencies that should not exist, from the IRS to the ATF to the FBI to the CDC to the U.S. Department of Education, we're not just going to tinker around the edges and say, hey, put a good person on top. Even the, I mean, I love President Trump. I really do. But he put Betsy DeVos on top, said reform it. Now nah, that's not good enough. You got to be willing to get in there and shut it down. Yep. That's how you revive the integrity of a republic. And then when it comes to education, take that $80 billion and put it back in the hands of parents in this country to choose where they send their kids to school. How old are you, ma'am? Eleven. You're eleven? What grade are you in? Sixth. Very proud of you for coming out here. We will make sure that you're not held accountable. The thing is, uh, President Trump passed a law for us veterans to go see a doctor if we wanted to after six months and not if, if the VA couldn't get us in. That's all good and said, but if something comes up that I have to go to the doctor at the last minute, if I don't call the VA to get permission, they will not pay or cover our deal. So with that in mind, and also with the veterans that stood up, I don't know if not, most people know it, but 22 veterans a day commit suicide. 22 a day. So just kind of a food for thought. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you for your service. I, I, I love your shirt. You want to stand up? Show everybody? Yeah. Don't tread on it. Literally or dead. I appreciate it. So I think this is, so somebody asked me the question yesterday, actually, I was in an event in Missouri, they said, what are you going to do for health care reform? I have a lot of views on health care reform, but I don't make promises of what Congress has to act on. See, this is one of the things where I learned from my predecessors. Repeal and replace Obamacare was the top legislative promise in 2016. It didn't happen. So none of what I'm going to tell you is going to be contingent on Congress acting. I'll tell you what I might want to do, but that's not a promise. But I can promise to do what the U.S. President can fix. Shutting down those government agencies. 75% headcount reduction in the U.S. federal government. Unlocking the U.S. energy sector. Drill, frack, burn coal, embrace nuclear. All the stuff I'm talking about, that's what the U.S. President can himself get done. And that brings me to the VA. Because even when people ask me about health care, there's only two parts of the healthcare system that I, as the U.S. President, can fix on my own. One is in the FDA, and one is in the VA. And the number one problem, as I see it in the VA, that we can fix is the loss of continuity of care. Okay, the number of times that somebody actually picks up and talks to one bureaucrat or one doctor and then gets switched, that's actually what happened to many of those 22. Actually, on my study, of it, that number might be closer to 40, actually. Yeah, it's, it's gone up a lot, and so it's somewhere between 22 and even over 40 veterans per day committing suicide. These are people who have served our country. And so I think there's two fixes that I can deliver as U.S. President. Bring meritocracy back to the VA. We do not have the best and the brightest working in the VA. We have people who are protected by so-called civil service protections. I'm going to get in there and clean house. I mean, that's the real answer is we can't give the bottom of the dregs to protect our veterans. To the contrary... We actually need meritocracy in the VA. The continuity of care problem has to end. And then with the FDA, I am a right to try evangelist. Okay, many of those veterans are turning to fentanyl in this country. I'm about to tell you something that's been another one of those cases, badly distorted, but that's okay. I'm going to stay, I'm going to state the truth so you all know actually what I do stand for. Many of those veterans are turning to fentanyl. How do we end the fentanyl crisis? First thing is you seal that southern border. We have enough fentanyl flowing across that southern border that is going to kill 50 times the number of people who died on 9-11 dying this year as a consequence of fentanyl poisoning in the United States. This is a fixable problem. So you want to protect the veterans. We can use the people who are serving now to protect the people who came before them by using our own military not to protect against some invasion across somebody else's border halfway around the world, but against the armed invasion across our own southern border in this country, in the United States. And everybody else in the neocon wing of the GOP disagrees with me on that prioritization. I stand by it. That's how you stop the influx of fentanyl into this country. 
But I also think that the FDA is a big problem here, too. This one where they, no, 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 fake news headline you will read. And I'm just telling you how the system works. I've learned. I'm, I'm not a politician. This is all new to me. I'm learning it in real time, and I'm sharing it with you. I wake up one day and says, Vivek Ramaswamy favors legalizing hard drugs. You got to smoke at something pretty potent to think that <laughs> I'd be favor legalizing hard drugs. And you read the fine print, what do they pick up on? Well, here's what I do favor. I favor medical choice, for, certainly for veterans who suffer from PTSD, many of whom are turning to fentanyl and then suicide. Yes, I do stand for ayahuasca, ketamine treatment, and psilocybin treatment for veterans who suffer from PTSD to have the right to choose, even if that's midway through going through the FDA approval process and not from a standard pharmaceutical company. That's not a Republican idea or a Democrat idea. But it is unconscionable that we have, I think the number is closer to 40 veterans per day committing suicide, many of whom suffer from PTSD. And I'm not going to be a commander-in-chief that just stands by and recites partisan slogans memorized in 1980, watching that happen on my watch. No, that's not how we're going to do things in this country. And so somebody's going to take that, just like the last one, right? You see, you know, and you're going to see this more. Outsider like me, coming in, challenging an establishment of orthodoxy, you're going to hear a lot more of this, and that's okay. So again, yeah. we thank the committee for the chance to be heard today. We stand ready to work with you on this important issue. Thank, Thank you, you Zippo. Um, and you're going to see as we're doing, going to do some juggling because we're going to also have a vote series. Always remember, you're on lots of televisions all over the campus. It's just the nature. So, um, and I was going to have Mr. Stubbe go first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my questions are for Mr. Harris. Uh, numerous employers have come forward with their stories about months and even year-long delays in processing their employee retention tax credits. Uh, in some cases, it's millions of dollars of these credits claimed by employers. How has the complexity of ERTC returns contributed to the backlog that employers are experiencing today? Well, I think there's been a lot of factors that have contributed to it. I think we, we start with the way that we initially asked for the credit, which was just the uh, filing and paper. I think that's the biggest contributor. Complexity has been a problem in many instances, particularly with the retroactive in coordination with PPP loans. So those of us that have tried to do things correctly, it was a complex calculation and it took some time. I, I can't speak to how some of the mills dealt with this because I think they sometimes found shortcuts that we couldn't find. But I, I think the, the real issue started with the fact that we knew a lot of the problems in this program were predictable. They were things that we could see coming. Anytime you ask paper to be sent, as I said in my opening statement, right. into a building with nobody working and already paper backup, delay shouldn't have been a surprise. But complexity is a problem in all of the tax code, not just this. In, in your testimony notes, uh, there were suggestions were given to the IRS to improve the ERTC processing. Uh, can you elaborate on what those suggestions were and whether the IRS is implementing those suggestions? We made a couple of suggestions, and others did, that, number one, recognizing the fact that these were going to be sent into built, we had to do paper, that there should be dedicated post office boxes, identifications, some way of prioritizing these claims uh, above the normal workload. Because, again, we were in the middle of a pandemic. These were funds to provide lifelines to small businesses and yet they just fell in. So we did not see any of the suggestions that we made taken. I know others had different things, allowing them to be claimed on a current year process return that could be filed electronically. So I, I think we just fell back into the way it was always done, and in that case, we had great delays. Do, is, do you have any other suggestions that would avoid some of the backlogs that we've seen in the future? Uh, well, I think... Uh, uh, I think generally speaking, and again, if we have the time and, and we're not in a pandemic, we should always look for ways not to, today what we're doing is solving a problem. I would like to find ways with the IRS to prevent the problem. Right. And I think one of the ways to do that is look for alternative ways, take advantage of electronic filing, take advantage of things that are currently being done and be creative in terms of just being, this is the way we always did it. If, right. if I might say something sure, also to that. Um, I mentioned the 7200 and it came out and I saw it was very fraudulent, it was a fax number in. In that case, the IRS did step up to the plate on it. But I think the other thing, the form being filed with just the number on it, 
see there's two, there's a startup business, but the main way to do this, there's two ways to do it. If they would have at least put a code on there and said one is based on gross receipts, they already have that information on the income tax return.